Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth of seven reflections sponsored by the Catholic, Al Catholic Bishops of Alberta and the Northwest Territories. My name is Sean Flynn. I'm the Interim President of St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta, and I'm happy to be your moderator for today. Today, we're just going to have some reflections and discussions on the Bishop's recent pastoral letter. The letter was released on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, and it's entitled, Save Your People, O Lord, and Bless Your Inheritance a pastoral statement on the impact of COVID-19 and the call to Christian renewal. So the purpose of these discussions is just to reflect from our home and family life and our businesses and our ministries and our vocations, how COVID-19 has impacted us and impacted our response to the gospel and our call to Christian commitment to community. So we're going to just give you a sense of what we're going to do. We're going to introduce our panelists. I'm going to share a small snippet from the, Arch the uh, Bishop's letter and then a small snippet on our main topic today, which is uh, the common good and how the impacts of COVID-19 affect our call to the common good as Catholic Christians. So, but first to introduce our, our panelists that are joining us today to help guide us through this discussion. First, we have Dr. Peter, Peter Baltutis, an associate professor and the CWL Chair of Catholic Studies at the St. Mary's University in Calgary. Welcome, Peter. Okay. Uh, we have Miss Martina Norwegian, a parishioner and a lay leader from Sacred Heart Parish in Fort Simpson in Northwest Territories. Welcome, Martina. Mm -hmm, merci. And then we have Mr. Gerald Seguia, a team member with Development and Community Relations of Catholic Social Services in Edmonton. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you. And we have Father Chris Schmidt, a blogger, a pastor, a member of the Flying Fathers hockey team, and a pastor at Our Lady of Angels Parish in Fort Saskatchewan. Well, welcome, Father Chris. Thank you. So I'm just going to quote a little, a little snippet from the letter itself to get us situated. And I think it's important as a group, we also have a sense of the, the, what the common good is in, in the church's perspective. So first from the letter, responsibility for serving and fostering the common good has application beyond the pandemic, of course. Generally speaking, we promote authentic human development and flourishing in a way that we live, care for others, work, organize society, and interact with one another. Sometimes, too, for the sake of the common good, we are required to address and amend sinful behaviors and attitudes that distance people socially from one or another that threaten to erode the well-being of persons. This includes such evils such as uh, prejudice, racism, bigotry, violations against human dignity and the right to life, promoting economic profit over people, and environmental degradation of our common home. So I hope you've all had a chance to read the letter and that kind of situates a compass for our discussion. But also because we're talking about the common good, I thought it would be prudent for us to at least reflect on the church's definition of the common good so we have a common understanding. We're going to share a small paragraph from Gaudium et Spes. It's from the Pastoral Constitution of Vatican II, The Church in the Modern World. Every day, human inter interdependence grows more tightly drawn and spreads by degrees over the whole world. As a result, the common good, that is, the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment, today takes on an increasingly universal complexion and consequently involves rights and duties with respect to the whole human race. This social order requires constant improvement, and I think COVID-19 is challenging us to this improvement. It must be founded on truth, built on justice, and animated by love. In freedom, it should grow every day toward a more humane balance. God's spirit is not absent from this development. So these, these two kind of pillars give us a sense of, of what's going on. So what I'm going to do is just we'll move through a set of questions that I hope will motivate our discussion. If someone doesn't uh, want to answer one of the questions, I'll probably call on you in the next question first. So just to make sure we get some even distribution among the, the contributors. And we'll just see where the discussion goes. So my first question really has to do with um, our, our guidance and root rootedness and anchor in our own Catholic Christian tradition. So if I can ask the group and people can jump in as, as they wish, what Catholic or Christian figures have given you inspiration and guidance in light of COVID-19? Specifically, what aspects of their life have been helpful for you in navigating these challenges and reaching out in Christian charity to others and building up the common good? So who would like to start and take a stab at this, this type of question? So, my PhD is in church history, um, and so these great figures of the Catholic intellectual and moral tradition are people that I spend a lot of time thinking about, reading about. And here at St. Mary's University, I teach a course on Catholic social teaching, 
And when I teach these different principles of Catholic social teaching, I try and find examples who from our Christian heritage has lived or embodied this principle. And so when I teach on the common good, the figure that I always turn to is St. Basil the Great. Uh, St. Basil the Great lived from 329 to 379. Um, he was a bishop in Caesarea in the region of Cappadocia, which is modern day Turkey. Um, he's venerated as a doctor of the church. But the reason why I like St. Basil the Great to help illustrate um, and really embody this principle of the common good is St. Basil um, came from a wealthy family and eventually he gave away all of his possessions and he lived in a monastery. What's fascinating is the monastery he lived in, he actually wrote the rule for this monastery. And when he wrote the rule for this monastery, if you read the rule of St. Basil, it's an important linchpin in the history of Christianity because prior to St. Basil, a lot of the Eastern monastics what we call hermetic monastics. They were based on their own individual ascetic spiritual journey. For St. Basil, the monastery was not a place so much of retreat from the world for an individual journey, but his rule is based on creating a model Christian community that benefits everybody. So what St. Basil did is his monastery, yes, it's focused around celebration of, uh, let's say we call it Liturgy of the Hours, but his monastery became essentially a, a whole matrix of social services. They offered um, schooling for those that couldn't afford it. They offered orphanages, modern day soup, uh, what they call a soup kitchen. They provided medical care. There were hospitals for the poor. So for someone like St. Basil, the idea of one's inward journey for love of God was intrinsically linked with love of neighbor. So for St. Basil, he also was a very powerful preacher. That's why he's known as a doctor of the church. And he wrote these prolific sermons about the power of how we're called not just be our own spiritual journey, but also be people living for others and having care for the common good. So St. Basil's the first person I want to flag. And there very briefly, um, since we've been in this COVID pandemic, um, so I am part of a group of lay Dominicans. And as our group, our chapter here in Calgary, we've been meeting over this pandemic period, we've been studying the lives of other lay Dominicans. And so just this past summer, we've been reflecting upon the life of Pere Giorgio Frassati. Um, and Pere Giorgio Frassati um, lived from 1901 to 1925. But the reason why I mentioned Frassati's name here is um, when he was 17 years old, so this is in 1918, it was the end of World War I. And Pere Giorgio Frassati, who was living in Northern Italy, he's living in an entirely changed landscape. I mean that both not just physically, seeing the sort of battlefields relatively close by, but also seeing essentially soldiers returning from war. He's seeing the economy was devastated. He's living in an environment where the cities are having to rebuild their economies. And so in some ways, post-World War I Italy is not that different from where we are right now, being a changed social reality. And prepared Giorgio Frassati, someone who was a young person, not as dramatic as Basil the Great was, but for Frassati, he was someone who in his everyday life was committed to the works of charity, and the works of justice, the works of charity, being with the poor, spending his time with them, giving also of his financial resources, his treasure to the poor. And that model of charity is very profound, but also working for political changes to make his um, post-World War I Italian political reality much more just, especially for those who are on the margins of society. I'm thinking here of returning soldiers coming back from the front. I'm thinking about people that were displaced because their jobs no longer exist because of World War I. So I think Pere Giorgio Prasadi is a wonderful example of a young person in small ways giving his life as an example of not just being selfish, trying to get ahead in the world, but being someone who is living for others. So those are my two examples. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So we have one early Christian example and one more recent. What about some others? Um, what, what Christian or Catholic figure has really kind of anchored you in this COVID pandemic? Well, for myself... As a priest, uh, the two that stood out very much at the beginning of the pandemic were uh, St. Charles Borromeo and St. Damien of Molokai. Uh, hasn't really come up in the last few months, but definitely at the beginning of the pandemic, a number of people approached me as a priest and then some friends of mine as priests and asked, Father, if, if somebody had COVID and they were dying, would you go and visit in the hospital? Because at the beginning, there was a much greater sense of fear around the possibility of the fatality of everyone who contracted COVID. And at least in the moment, I don't know if the reality, if it was 
more significant if I could have, but the answer was absolutely yes. My role as a priest, my life as a priest is to care for souls from the moment of conception until they return to God. And so it doesn't matter what the external circumstances are. That's who I'm called to be. And St. Charles Borromeo was priest and cardinal of the church during one of the plagues in Europe at another period in history where churches were closed because people could not gather together during the plague. But St. Charles Borromeo would celebrate mass from the rectory up in the window in if you can imagine old European towns where the church was right in the square of the city. And so he would celebrate mass from his window so that everybody else from their windows in the square could see him celebrate mass. And then he would go out into the streets and bring uh, the sick and the dying Holy Communion. And then St. Damien of Molokai, a more recent saint who at the time when Molokai, one of the Hawaiian islands was a leper colony, saw that they had no priest to look after them, no one to bring them the sacraments when they were suffering. Everybody just kind of shunned them to the side because they didn't want to or didn't know how to deal with their disease. And so St. Damien willingly went in the midst of them to go and serve them, um, knowing full well the probability of him contracting leprosy himself and even kind of depriving himself of the sacraments where the only way he could go to confession was to stand on the edge of the island and a priest would be in a boat out far away because that priest didn't want to do the sacrifice of accepting leprosy. And he would have to scream out his sins to the priest out on the boat um, so that he could have his own confession heard. But because of his sacrifice, his willingness to be with those in the leper colony, they were able to receive Holy Communion and the sacrament of the sick and confession regularly during this time of suffering in their life because he reached out in that way. So as a priest, those two men kind of in times of, of sickness um, and the way that they exemplified um, that priesthood that we're called to in the church. Thanks, Father Chris. So Gerald and Martina, have any Catholic or Christian figures inspired you during this, you know, some of the difficult moments of COVID? I think that um, my, my thoughts keep going back to, uh, as I was reflecting on this, my thoughts kept going back to Mother Teresa and um, where she was in the midst of um, all the suffering in Calcutta and, um, and how she handled that. And so my thoughts and my reflections kept going back there. But again, even more so in when it was in May, when uh, it, we were praying the rosary to, um, to Mary, and then again, we started again here in October. So those two um, have really been reflective and been on, on our minds here at church. Thanks, Martina. Gerald, what about you? Uh, personally, um, while I was reflecting on this, I really... Um, try to, uh, to bring it home and I try to focus it on a Christian figure that I'm seeing on a daily basis that I've worked with and not really going back to the, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the other Catholic uh, figures. And um, uh, I, I, I spent some time really reflecting on uh, the work of a local priest here uh, in Edmonton uh, who has put his time uh, in to really be present and support the people in the inner city, uh, that despite all the challenges that uh, the people are faced with, uh, this priest didn't even stop continuing to do his work. Uh, he's working with the most vulnerable in the city, and he remained committed to, uh, to whatever he's doing. And for me, I looked at his, uh, the, the aspect of, of self-sacrifice that he put in, uh, as most of the uh, the, the, the figures that we do have in the Catholic Church, uh, he, he didn't lose his joy uh, um, uh, despite the adversity and the hard situations that he, he was uh, doing his work, even at a time when his church was, uh, uh, was it, it caught fire, but he, this, uh, this priest really continued to, 
to be able to reach out to the people in whichever way or shape. He remained committed and supporting the community. And uh, I looked at his self-sacrifice that we've seen among these, uh, 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 you know, contemporary and modern figures in the Catholic Church. And I, I really focused on that and, and uh, spent some time looking at how uh, the aspect of self-sacrifice has been for him. He remained very joyful in his work. Um, and then also the aspect of keeping on building the relationships uh, with the people that he was serving. He, uh, when I interacted with him, really focusing and looking at all those other, you know, great uh, people that we look up to in the Bible and the church teaching, uh, this priest... Um, uh, remained uh, keeping the relationships going. Uh, he kept on uh, looking uh, for the poor and the vulnerable within the community, even despite uh, times whereby uh, the, you know, our leaders asked people to uh, uh, stay home. Uh, for him, he worked with the homeless individuals because that's their home. The streets uh, were, were their home, uh, whereby uh, when we're asked, stay and you can connect with other people on Zoom, for him, he couldn't because the people that he's working with uh, don't have Zoom, don't have internet, and couldn't even spend time to go in the libraries where they would uh, be able to access the internet. So he remained there, he was present, and also uh, really showing that he's journeying with the people, uh, using those examples of the great uh, you know, Christian figures we look up to in the Catholic Church. To me, he inspired me, and I really... Um, thought that I would share that with you uh, during this discussion here. Thanks, Jared. And, and this, this really, um, I think uh, a lot of your comments echo kind of what we want to explore in the next question. So, I mean, we have experts from the academy here, from, from pastoral service in the parish, from, from ordained life, from, from, from service and Catholic social services. So if we can reflect a bit on, uh, the, the bishops mentioned this idea of self-sacrifice, um, and COVID has really drawn us into this, the Christian concept of sacrifice, uh, they mentioned on page one of their letter. So what are some ways maybe in your families or in your personal circles, your cohorts as we call them in Edmonton or Alberta, uh, or in your ministries that you've seen either been personally challenged towards deeper into the Christian concept of self-sacrifice, or have you observed others be challenged by the idea of self-sacrifice, which I think builds up the common good? First, from a personal perspective, um, my experience definitely over the first three to four months of the pandemic, this is kind of a public confession, and I haven't confessed it to the Archbishop yet, so if he ends up watching, I guess this is my confession to the Archbishop. Uh, obedience was really tested for me as a priest because I had certain thoughts and ideas of what I thought could be done to care for the people during the time of pandemic. And as we know, restrictions were placed, not just from the federal, from the government, but also within uh, individual dioceses by the bishops in how we went about the care for souls and um, giving the sacraments to the people. And so for me, that was a huge challenge to my willingness to sacrifice that I don't think I did very well with at the beginning um, because I thought there was good that could be done, but it was my good. Um, it wasn't the good that was seen. The bishops have the, the responsibility to the people as a whole um, of the whole diocese. And so seeing that um, challenged me and I had to work through that willingness because I don't think a real sense of self-sacrifice exists very strongly in my generation. Um, we have a sense of some kind of sacrifice where, you know, I deprive myself of particular foods or going to the gym to get a particular health and physique that I want. I'm willing to make that kind of sacrifice, but the real kind of sacrifice that asks me, asks me to let go of something good for myself for the sake of something good for someone else, I think that idea might almost be becoming foreign to the way that we live our life. Um, but in terms of others, you know, with all this public debate about masks or no masks, nurses went in, uh, still working their 12 hour shifts, wearing masks and face shields and gloves and 
all the personal protective equipment. And I know that for me, after a couple of hours with a simple mask over this beard getting itchy, um, I'm ready to, if I had to wear my mask any longer than that, the beard would have had to come off because I can't take it anymore after, after that while. So that willingness to do their job and to be present to those people, despite all of the extra things that they have to carry and submit themselves, I think part of that self-sacrifice. Yeah, no, thanks, Father Chris. So for others, uh, um, concepts of self-sacrifice. Yeah, um, uh, the kind of work that we do at Catholic Social Services, we guided for, uh, by, by our faith to bring hope to people uh, in need with humility, compassion, and respect. Uh, uh, when it comes to sharing uh, the, the, the sacrifices that I've seen, um, um, I, I would like to uh, really uh, talk about the sacrifices that have been made by the, our frontline staff workers uh, at a time where it's been so hard for everyone. I remember when uh, COVID hit in March, uh, we were all asked to, you know, social distance and uh, keep apart from others. Um, I, I have looked at people sacrificing, um, uh, and this would be like the shared sacrifices that have been to light by our staff. Uh, for example, we have programs that do support individuals with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, some of them uh, physical disabilities, but at the time whereby they, you're being asked, uh, keep a distance, but again, all these people uh, have to depend on you for their livelihood, for their survival, uh, to do whatever they have to do. Uh, I have seen staff, uh, 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 being a Catholic social service agency, again, still guided by uh, the church uh, uh, Catholic social teachings, uh, really uh, sacrificing and putting in the time and all the energy that they really needed to make sure that uh, the individuals in our care really do succeed. Uh, they put everything that you would uh, imagine their families aside to, to, to really spend time and, and be present for these people. Uh, people sacrificed to, uh, to be present for women who are fleeing domestic violence uh, coming to us because, you know, the social challenges did stop uh, despite the COVID and, you know, being asked to stay home and, you know, keep to yourself, keep to your families. Uh, I've seen people sacrificing, uh, like you see uh, someone choosing uh, to leave home, not even taking on the, uh, the, the, sub, the, the, the support that was given by the government, as uh, I think some of us have heard on radio and on TV, we've seen uh, uh, some of the employers are struggling to say, oh, you know, we cannot have our staff coming back because of the support that is present there, out there. But I've seen sacrifice in the work of the people uh, that we do, um, you, know, uh, you know, interact with here at Catholic Social Services and doing the, uh, the frontline work on a daily basis. So I, I just thought that I would share that uh, with, with every one of us. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Gerald. Others, this concept of sacrifice, and, and the bishops also mentioned sacrifice, that things that are essential to the Christian life, right, that we might have had to pause on or give up. So others, Martina or Peter? Uh, I'll, my comments will be brief here. Um, you know, the pandemic hits everyone in such different ways. And I think all of us are called to make sacrifices of varying degrees. And a lot of times based on our own situation, um, sacrifices can be great or small. Our challenge um, is I have a young family, so I have three young children, and one of my children um, is on the autism spectrum. And so for him, there's a very strong sense sometimes of rigidity of thought. And for him, um, it may sound trivial, but for him, he spends his entire 364 days a year looking forward to his birthday every year. His birthday for him is a very, very important event. And it's one also in which he can see his friends. Um, so this year, um, his birthday is in April. He was not able to have a birthday party this year. And this was very, very hard for him to understand why he couldn't have a birthday party with his friends. Now, on one level, this may seem very trivial, but for someone where his entire world is marked by these kind of milestones, that was very, very challenging for him. But on the flip side, you know, 
uh, this is back to Father Chris's comment, it's actually led to some really, I think, important teaching moments uh, for us as parents who have young children to try and say, yes, especially, you know, I have a, a four and a half year old now who has to wear a mask when she goes to kindergarten and trying to explain to her, she doesn't want to wear it, but we wear this not for you so much, but to help those around you. You're asked to inconvenience yourself to help the health of those around you. So it's led to some important teaching moments in terms of trying to teach our kids the value of this world is not all about us and what we want, but rather it's about making sure that everyone has a chance to have a lifestyle that's happy, healthy, and holy. And so if we in one small way can inconvenience ourselves for the greater good, for the common good, that's an important lesson. And surprisingly, it's been a much easier sell than we thought it would be. My wife and I are surprised actually how quickly our children have picked up on this. From a young age, the value of caring for others to the point now where every so often, if we're going uh, out somewhere as a family and just because I'm busy gathering things for all the kids and I forget my mask, my kids will say, stop dad, where's your mask? So they're already built into this idea of being concerned for others. So in some ways it's been frustrating with sacrificing, but also gives me hope that perhaps if we can teach this lesson well to our younger children, they can embody this and carry it forward for the next generation. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Martina, what about what about up north and, and your pastoral work up there? What what aspects of Christian sacrifice have come out through this pandemic? Uh, just as Peter was talking and others were talking, I was thinking, is it a sacrifice? Is it because um, I think working in the church has taught me to be selfless, like to be totally um, always listening and, um, and not to think about myself, like, and, and to be open to listen and, um, and not to like, we, we don't give advice. We don't, we don't suggest anything. We just listen and we're there to help wherever we can. And so I've often, you know, just listening to the others, and I was thinking, is it a sacrifice? I think that when I think of sacrifice, I think of the doctors and the nurses and people who are there, um, you know, um, being brave and putting their life on the line for us. Now that is what a sacrifice is. And whereas uh, here in the church, we give the spiritual assistance, the help to, um, to walk with the people. And like um, where, where Peter said there was teaching moments. And um, a lot of it, like for myself here, like on, on our island, we have 1,200 people. And so a lot of it is, and because our borders are closed here in the Northwest Territories and we don't have any, uh, any um, cases, um, and when we, we, we have a couple of cases, but they're in the mines and they're isolated. So it's not, we can see what's going on um, across the border and in the, in the provinces and stuff, but it hasn't really hit home here. And we are doing everything that uh, we're told. And as a leader, not only here in the church, but also at work and at home and as a mother, um, and then to be to be leading and to be up on on what is going on and to be able to tell people even though it hasn't affected us personally that it's out there and that it is real and that and how we have to because we're taking precautions that that is why we're in like we're where we're at and so i find personally where uh, we're open to any questions. We're open to to help, and uh, I see so much, so much more of the community coming together to assist and to help. And um, sometimes I wonder if it is um, too much. Like people are not fully grasping the the enormity of what the, this COVID nineteen is. Oh, thanks, Martin. Yeah, that's an important perspective that there's communities like, especially in the East Coast, that have been able to, you know, resist what the bigger cities are dealing with, right? And it impacts those people differently, too. 
Yeah. So um, the the bishops have a list of social issues. I think it's eight or ten, and I think we've seen over this pandemic that uh, it depends on our work in ministry, of course. But this has shone a light on different social ills and sins of of human of humanity that we need to focus on. Um, if we look at some of these social issues like care for vulnerable people, education of our young, isolation and depression, domestic violence, social discord, racism, bigotry, religious intolerance, uh, general anxieties, economic instability for a lot of people, and the access to basic needs. If we just look at this list a bit, so for each of you in your work in ministry, um, maybe what uh, what which of these lists uh, things have arisen to the surface more, or maybe if you know about these in your work, which have been brought to the attention of a wider group of people and that the Catholic church, especially Catholics who are working in the church and dedicated to their work can focus more on and become more aware of. So what of the list there of social kind of discord uh, have people noticed has, has risen in people's minds and brought attention to things that we as Catholics need to consider more and be more active in, in working against? You know, um, working with the social service um, uh, field or in the uh, field of social services, all these ills that the bishops have highlighted, uh, those are the challenges that we faced with on a daily basis and even all our staff that uh, really uh, go through and they see on a daily basis. Uh, but in a special way today, I wanted to really look at the, uh, the increased rates of domestic violence, uh, elder abuse and other forms of interpersonal uh, violence. Um, during this, this period, um, through the interaction with our staff, We've uh, noticed that uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of youth and families needing shelter, uh, and they're trying to flee domestic violence, and uh, there's been an increased a number of uh, elder abuse cases that have been reported to us as a social service agency where we've been called in to go, despite all the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the challenges that we faced with during this time. Uh, this has been uh, really uh, been an increase because we all know that the perpetrators um, of domestic violence, you end up having them in the same vicinity with their victims. Though, uh, you know, uh, uh, domestic violence is one of those big, big challenges that uh, we even as a church, as the Catholic Church, even here in Alvaro and in, in, in the North Western Territories, really need to be able to focus on. So, uh, so we've experienced uh, an increased number of those reports and cases because the uh, victims have nowhere to escape. Uh, where will you go? Uh, you just stuck with your family and also the children are home and they're seeing all this is uh, this happening. I would say that at the moment now, uh, why I really wanted to throw more light on the domestic violence, all our women shelters are full to capacity. Uh, and they are coming with the children and young little children who are fleeing domestic violence, and that has really, really been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, you know, uh, we've seen an increase in 67% increase in the number of reported cases of elder abuse uh, because the elderly uh, have been more isolated than before. Uh, so having someone to be present with them there with all the abuse that comes with it, they have no way to, to, they have no way to escape that. So, uh, so those, those items there really have, have showed that uh, we as a church, uh, we need to be able to understand uh, the challenges that come with social isolation, but also we think about uh, uh, people have been isolated in, in their way, but there's a lot of suffering there. And um, that also brings in the idea of uh, thinking about the elderly people that have been isolated but now are going through the elder abuse that all the time they have been kept to themselves. How hard is that? And uh, if we've been also able to uh, experience it, maybe it will be an opening, a door opening there for us to understand what really it feels, but also to think deeply in all our initiatives as Catholics, uh, as we live our faith, how can we continue to support these people, these individuals in whichever form whether they're women fleeing domestic violence, whether they're children living in uh, violent homes, or the elderly that are being abused uh, physically, financially, and on all the other forms of uh, abuse that has been going on and is continuing to go on, where we don't know whether we're going to have a second wave 
or you know uh, what can we do in our own uh, you know uh, areas of uh, service uh, as Catholics. Thanks, Gerald. Yeah, I, know, I mean, this is definitely a reminder for us that these these social ills are always present, right? And we often we sometimes ignore them, especially elder abuse came up in the national media, um, especially when we saw the homes be devastated. And we even saw that in our own, um, our own Catholic communities as well, not necessarily the abuse, but just the devastation that COVID can have for these homes. What about the others in your work in ministry or anything else from this list kind of uh, that you either saw other people become aware of or, or you became more aware of in your work in ministry? It made me really question the way that we kept care for our elderly. Um, as priests, we were still able to go in um, in the event that they were dying. That was when we were allowed to go in, um, which anybody who's journeyed with someone dying, the care is needed much sooner than just when they're actively dying. Um, and then just the biggest outbreaks happened in our seniors' homes. I don't know this for certain, but Anecdotally, I heard that you know even the, the nursing care in some of the homes, it was very structured that they could go into the rooms to do administer the medication and the care that they needed. But even the nurses that were working and the, the caregivers didn't have, couldn't, couldn't provide what the families weren't able to give because they weren't there. They couldn't have extended conversations with the seniors in care because they had to limit their contact with each other. And so it's made me really question is our current model for how we care for seniors really what it should be? And I think in kind of human history, we're kind of dealing with a unique reality that is coming to the surface that our life expectancy has increased a lot. Because of our health care, we're able to live longer with difficult illness or diseases. For example, dementia, Alzheimer's, can live with that much longer now, but that's not an easy thing to live with. And so just placing one of our seniors in a home to deal with that is that the best thing for them. I heard some people that as soon as they heard the pandemic break out, they went and got their parent from the care home and brought them to live with them uh, moving forward because they knew that they were going to be isolated and didn't want to stay separate. And so they brought them into their home, obviously someone that didn't need full-time care, um, so that's the, one of the big questions for me is, is our current model for, for caring for our elderly really what it should be? Yeah. And should we be doing, thinking of doing it differently? Yeah. And then, you know, we have, we have other models available to us in the Catholic world of religious communities and how they take care of their elderly. And some religious communities that, that are stressed financially invite other religious communities to be part of that. And then some lay people start joining and it forms a different model of care at the end of life. It also reminds us all the challenges communicating to the public, the needs of the end of life care and pastorally walking with people don't just end at that moment, right? It's the months and, and days leading to everything. So what about others? Uh, these, this list of, of pastoral kind of challenges and social challenges. Um, I mean, one of the challenges in my world that I work in here at St. Mary's University, I work with young people. So I'm working with people ages 18, 19, 21, 22. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm seeing with a lot of the young people is one, um, as soon as we quickly had to pivot away from being an in-person delivery model to now going online all of a sudden, um, for a lot of students, that was a big challenge in terms of even not having access to things like internet and technology. So that became a real issue. How do you allow those students to learn who don't have the simple hardware um, or access to um, a steady internet connection? So that was a one challenge. Another challenge I was finding with young people is um, those that were connected and were online, um, I was talking with one, uh, some of our students when they came back to start the fall semester and were online again, and I was talking with one of our upperclassmen who I know quite well, and I asked him how, it was, how did his first week go? And he said, Dr. Valtudis, he says, I am as tired now at the end of week one is I usually am at the end of a whole semester. So the idea of Zoom fatigue, of just sitting in front of screens all day, um, was physically tiring and exhausting for them. So that was interesting. Um, but I think most importantly was that for a lot of young people, I know bright, intelligent um, people who are graduating, there are not jobs for them right now. 
And that's been a real source of anxiety and struggle. For some students, it means not having a summer job, so loss of employment, and that means that they're at home without income. But for other students who've now committed four years to a degree and they're graduating, there's no job to move on to. So there's a lot of sense of fear and anxiety about just economic conditions and opportunities for young people to enter into the workforce. So that's a real source of frustration for young people I've heard a lot about. So I think the uh, next question is, is just getting to the practical and, and I think Jared and others kind of hinted to this. Um, what, about, what about the saint next door? So who has people seen in their life and work and ministry? It can be people in our Catholic Christian community, those not in our Christian community, because we're talking about the common good. Um, who's been the saint next door for you in this, in this type of situation? Well, one of the things that was evident early on was that we didn't have proper means of communicating with our parishioners to begin with. Right, yes. Um, and so my plea to the people by live stream mass, because we weren't in person already, was please think about those people that sit next to you at mass regularly and think about reaching out and making sure that they're okay because I can't think of everybody and we don't have proper means of contacting everybody. Um, so it's been just the regular parishioner that's kind of taken under their wing to look after somebody who doesn't have cl family close by or, you know, I know one lady in the parish since mass has been back, um, a senior later, she picks her up in the car every day and brings her to Mass now because her regular ride to Mass before isn't able to do it anymore. Um, so it's just been, the for me at the parish level, it's just been those who've been willing to think of their neighbor in the midst of this and do real simple, practical things to, to reach out to, to walk with them through this. Right. Yeah, we're, we're challenged to relive the basics of the Christian life through the gospel, yeah. right? So, Martina, we're just talking about the, uh, the people who are the saint next door who have inspired us through this, through this COVID crisis. Have you, Martina, found some saints next door that have been really impressive for you, that have guided you through this? The, um, the people that have guided me um, are social distancing and like my, like my circle of people who have encouraged me and kept me going have are the church is the church um, like we have Bible study every Thursday which we no longer do and so we haven't been in contact there and um, with the other churches here we have three churches here in uh, Simpson we have the Pentecostal and the Anglican Church and us here and. Um, so the Pentecostal is, does, isn't having any services, any, um, any singing or anything like that. And so it's almost um, a shift of, um, of finding other people who you've never reached out to and, and how that, um, that is opening new doors, opening new um, uh, opportunities to reach out to people who you never thought you would. So um, I know that my neighbor, she, uh, we've been neighbors since 1963. So she's coming over all the time where she never had before. And so, and so that, that again, is just like living right next door and not knowing her was almost opening um renewing that friendship, renewing that relationship with her and her husband. So it's been really good. Right. Oh, that's good. Gerald and Peter, any saints next door of, you know, even those outside of our Catholic sphere that can teach us as Catholics how to navigate this pandemic? I'll just um, piggyback off of Martina's last story because our, my saint next door, I have two, but one of them was a literal saint next door in terms of um, we have a neighbor that borders us on the uh, part of our back fence um, who just because of schedules, we hardly ever see them, uh, never, let alone talk to them. Uh, but they have a really fantastic, beautiful, lush garden. And so uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, what she did is she actually came to our front door and just made us a bouquet. Just to say, just want to make sure you guys are doing well. So giving a gift of her garden, these beautiful, in this case it was pussy willows, and she brought it to us. 
it was very beautiful. And as Martina said, it actually sparked conversation. So because of that, we got a chance to socialize a bit. And now we talk to them um, at least once a week. So in many ways, kind of it, sadly, it took a pandemic like this to allow neighbors to start talking to each other and sharing gifts with each other. So um, that was been a really, um, that was a really powerful expression of her generosity. Um, the second one I can think of is we have a friend of ours who lives um, out in London, Ontario. And this person actually is a bit of an amateur seamstress. So and all of a sudden the desire was we all need masks. What this person offered to do is in her free time is that she made these beautiful masks and she was able to make some for children, for adults, a variety of sizes and shapes and colors. And so she basically put out through social media, if anyone needs a mask, let me know, I'll make it for them. And what she said is that once she makes this mask, um, she doesn't want any money for them, but she says a suggested donation is this much per mask, but she said, pay it to a local charity. So through over the course of the last, what, six or seven months, um, she's made close to a thousand individual masks, which she's made out of her own um, finances and mailed across Canada. Um, as a result, she's been able to raise thousands of dollars for local charities all across Canada. So to me, that's just a beautiful example of giving up her time and also her own finances, but also many ways enriching local, uh, local charities all across Canada. So to us, that was a very beautiful witness of her using, here's a situation, she's not sure how to respond, but using her own unique gifts and talents, in this case being a seamstress, to make the world a better place. Yeah. And Gerald, you had mentioned the priest in the beginning, which was definitely a saint next door for you. Did you have others that you'd, you'd been thinking about throughout this um, time? Yeah, uh, throughout my work, I spent time really working with schools and, and uh, you know, elementary and kids are at different levels. Uh, but I think what stood out uh, to me during this time, uh, when the students and um, stayed home, they were connected at all times. They had their computers and laptops and, and everything available for them. Uh, but again, through the work we do, like I mentioned uh, uh, before, uh, we, we, we've had all our shelters uh, for women fleeing domestic violence, you know, uh, occupied to capacity. And um, what really touched me and I felt these are real sense next door are the little, little kids in one of the school Catholic districts um, who, when we shared with them that there's this mother uh, who, has, who is staying with us in this shelter, but she wants to start doing a course uh, to uh, respond and to deal with domestic violence, but all that she needs is a laptop. Something uh, that uh, most of us might think it's some, something easily you can get and use. This mom didn't have a laptop, but she needed to get into uh, a training on domestic violence and, um, and also some bit of education um, happening online, but she didn't have the, uh, the resource to be able to, uh, to do this. I shared this with one of the school divisions and in just a matter of two days, uh, the students had mobilized themselves. Remember, they just returned to, to school. They mobilized themselves and bought for this lady a laptop for her to be able to go to do her courses online, uh, to go through the training, how to deal with abuse and how to get out of these situations. And to me, the way they galvanized and helped to lift this lady out of the situation that she was in, I look at them as saints next door. Uh, the love and the commitment they had and for them to understand that during this time, if you're not connected, you might not have too much to do and you stay where you are and you can't be able to connect and do anything unless you try to do things online. So to me, that really stood out uh, uh, through uh, this time and um, uh, I keep on looking at that and say, okay, even the young generation has been able to understand that they can lift others out of their situations in whichever small way. Uh, you just imagine a group of elementary students collecting money to buy a laptop. This, you think about $500 plus to buy this laptop, but they did this in just a period of two, two days. Uh, so uh, I think I thought I needed to share that story there as those are my saints next door. Oh. No, thank, thank you all for those examples. And I think those examples also show, as Catholics, we're reminded we live in the world <laughs> and we have to be witnesses in the world. And this also has broken down barriers. And those are some opportunities as well, barriers between neighbors or people we haven't talked to as much. 
Now, now, now I have to do it because I'm a biblical scholar, but I'm going to draw us into, into scripture for a bit here. Um, let's reflect on, I mean, we know that the church's teaching tradition really reflects on the scripture bringing us to, into, into a deeper relationship with Christ. So has there been any biblical story or character or figure in the Bible who you through walking with COVID have, or walking through COVID, have, have a deeper appreciation for that biblical story or character or a, a story in the Bible or a character that has guided you in this time or has given you inspiration and hope? For me, um, one of them is, um, I guess once again, being a church historian, but just really carefully reading through and praying through the Acts of the Apostles. So in the early church, this idea of all people coming together, caring for one another, everyone's needs are provided for. So that model of really a community-based church, it's not about individuals, but a community, to me that's really impactful as the way the early Christians lived and shared resources with one another. And then the second one is, um, is I think mean, going back through the, the Hebrew scriptures um, and this idea of the covenant that God, maybe Yahweh, makes with the Hebrew people. So it's not so much a covenant that Yahweh is making with Abraham or with Noah, but it's a covenant with Yahweh and the Israelite people as a whole. So this idea that God's blessing is for everyone, not for individuals, but for this whole family, which we're all spiritually grafted onto. So I think if you read the scriptures carefully, you can see all these aspects of the common good theologically embedded in there that oftentimes we simply would just gloss over. And then this, the last thing I'll mention is I was, um, wife and I were uh, working through these questions last night because my wife is my theological advisor. And uh, the one thing that she mentioned, I want to mention to the group, is she was mentioning how she really resonates and connects with the women who went to go anoint the body of Jesus but couldn't. So on Friday night, Good Friday, Jesus was in the tomb, and the women who want to go, they can't on Saturday because Saturday is the Sabbath. So they have to wait until Sunday. So the idea of not being able to do what you know you ought to do and that frustration, I think a lot of us have mentioned this idea of not being able to connect we want, how we want to, that frustration is there. But um, also, I think um, it was mentioned earlier, this, this sense of hope, though, that hopefully, even though we can't do what we want, it's hopefully for a greater purpose, and that uh, we're doing things walking always with the light of faith, but that sense of hope. Thanks, Peter. Others, any biblical story or character that you've come to appreciate more throughout COVID? Obvious one, but the, the Good Samaritan, yeah. um, who comes across the, the beaten man on the road. And kind of from that idea that you mentioned just before this question of the breaking down of barriers, what always sticks with me is um, the early church, what stood out to all those who were not Christian about the Christians was their love in the way that they cared for the sick, the way that they treated women, and the way that they cared for the poor. Um, and it was that example in the way that they didn't just care for their own fellow Christians, but they cared for all people. Um, Martina mentioning um, St. Teresa of Calcutta. She cared for all the dying, didn't matter which caste in India, whether they were Hindu or Christian or Muslim or otherwise. It was that sense and that re awareness that we are all connected to each other in Christ Jesus. We are all part of that same creation made in the image and likeness of God. And so that good Samaritan, the one who breaks over that barrier to do what he knows is right and just for this man. Um, and so I think, especially with the way that we see kind of around us, these political factions being created, whether that's within the church or outside of the church, everybody kind of making their camp of this is kind of where I find comfort, whether that's socially or ideologically or whatever it is. As Christians, we're called to exist beyond any of those parameters that we seem to want to place within our society. And so re-examining ourselves as Catholics and going, okay, well, are we living that out or are we just another group kind of finding safety and shelter within ourselves as like-minded people who want to follow Christ or are we actually following Christ by breaking down barriers and caring for the sick and the poor and the marginalized like Pope Francis keeps 
reminding us time and time again. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Gerald and Martina, any biblical characters or figures that you've come to appreciate more during COVID? Personally, I think I'll look at the figure of Mother Teresa, um, whereby uh, she talked about um, the greatest poverty today is uh, loneliness. Um, uh, when, when I look at uh, that statement that she made, and I reflected upon that as a, as a Christian, as a Catholic, it just gave me an opportunity to think about not the loneliness that I go through as an individual, but the loneliness that other people are going through, whether um, they are in camps somewhere in, um, you know, in a place where there is war, uh, where, uh, whether they are fleeing um, uh, some kind of uh, social injustice in the communities where they are and where they live. Uh, it, it just brought that to me to, to, to think about it deeply and also to help me look at the global community and the suffering that comes with that. Um, and also for us to be able to look beyond our small, you know, villages, our small communities um, and where we live here and think about the rest as, uh, as a whole, uh, because we faced with the same challenges, but we are located in different uh, uh, places and we are isolated in different ways, whether spiritually, whether physically, uh, but also any other kind of uh, uh, loneliness that we are going through. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Martina, what about you? You mentioned that you weren't able to participate in Bible study with your community as normal. Um, has there been any biblical characters or figures that have, or stories from the Bible that have kind of resonated with you and your community during this time? The, um, I think, again, you know, just, just to comment on some of the other uh, comments that were made, um, in the uh, sense of hope and the uh, questioning ourselves about having to rethink of how we are serving our people, am I doing, am I doing all I can, and, um, and, uh, and questioning that. And I think that uh, it's through the hope that um, and uh, and the faith in knowing that this too shall pass. And um, I keep thinking, like personally, I keep thinking of um, the the scripture that keeps resonating to me is uh, the woman at the well, where there's that hope that Jesus is the living is the living water, and that uh, and that we need. Like I know that when um, things get frustrating and there's a sense of loss and um, uh, that I need to hang on to that. And so yesterday uh, I, share, I shared all these questions and that with um, our priest here and he shared a beautiful story and his reflection on um, uh, in Exodus about the Red Sea and when the people came there and it's like, why did, why did you bring us here and we're going to die? We want to go back kind of thing. And so he shared about that and it was like, it was so beautiful, like to hear somebody else's um, reflection on this. But for me personally, it's that living, that hope of that living water. Yeah. So that's what I keep going back to. Yeah. No, thank you all. And I, I want our listeners to, to kind of remind themselves that the panelists have given both figures from the Christian Catholic tradition and uh, some reflections from scripture. So this could form a really good compass for the Christian life as you meditate in, in your time of COVID and, and all the challenges that are before us. Now, I, I like how we're kind of ending. We're ending on a note of Christian hope, which we are people of hope and people of the gospel. So the last question I'd like to ask the group is that, um, I mean, really, really our job is evangelization and proclaiming the gospel to the world. And COVID has both challenged us at, us at it, that and also provided us other opportunities that we weren't aware of. So just in your work and ministries as, as um, experts in your areas, how has the evangelization of the gospel perhaps changed because of COVID-19? Um, maybe there are some things, new opportunities that we haven't seen as Catholics before. We know it's been challenged, but how, what are new opportunities towards evangelization that, that the church can think through um, as, as we hopefully move towards some sort of normal? 
we look at where we are in the world right now, we can be very frustrated, we can be angry, we can be disappointed. But I think we also can try and say, what are new creative ways that the Holy Spirit perhaps is calling us to look at new initiatives? So one of the ones uh, that I've seen, we had some limited success with here, is on, when I, when I, um, with our young people who are struggling to find community and connection, is I helped organize um, a hike slash outdoor mass. Because some people aren't comfortable meeting inside, we basically, we live right in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So we organized a group, we had uh, 20 people and we hiked in Kananaskis and we hiked to the top of the mountain. We had permission from our bishop to have an outdoor mass on top of the mountain. And it was a really powerful experience for the young people, especially to be able to, number one, spend that time on the hike, on the ascent, just connecting with people once again, and then when it's up there to celebrate the sacraments together. And that was a really beautiful moment. So that was a creative endeavor that worked well for us, and we hope to do more of those in the future. Um, another opportunity I've been seeing is some of the religious communities um, across Canada are getting very, very creative. Um, so for example, I know the Jesuits in Canada, um, and my wife in particular is part of um, the Christian Life community, the CLC groups. And what they've been doing is they've been meeting online through Zoom, and they've been working through basically using um, the examine prayer of St. Ignatius, but bringing it through in terms of how do you take the examine in light of COVID, in light of the pandemic. Um, here in Calgary, the FCJ Center has a series of programs bringing Ignatian wisdom once again, how do you respond to the situation, but doing it all through online Zoom formats. So no longer people have to be living just geographically close to the FCJ Center or these other communities, but there's a lot of different ministries that are now happening online. And the last thing I'll mention is even just uh, last night, uh, the Feast of the Rosary. So my lay Dominican group um, were scattered across the city, but we gathered online to say rosary together. So even though we're geographically distanced from one another, um, in some ways, technology has allowed for creative new opportunities to happen. So those are my few thoughts. Yeah, no, thank you. For others, um, not necessarily barriers to evangelization, but opportunities going forward. Uh, to me, I think, like uh, uh, the previous speakers mentioned, there has been more creativity within the church on how to reach out to parishioners. And I really like that, even in a special way, reaching out to the youth. Uh, I think it has given us, the COVID time has given us a moment uh, to think outside our old norms and the way we used to do things uh, in the old ways. Uh, uh, you know, it has helped us to explore more, even better options uh, to reach out to the youth. Uh, to, to, when you think about the online faith studies, that now um, the youth can stay home in their comfort and they can do their online faith study uh, at home, other than you expecting them to go to the church or expecting them to go. Well, it's got the bad part of it that we lose the human connection, which is very, very key uh, for us. Uh, but uh, that is something that is really good for us to build on uh, to see where if you cannot get the youth to you, can you organize something uh, to do online for them and in their comfort other than uh, living wherever they are to do that. And also people being able, for example, again, youth to do what they can do during their, their free time, not having them timed. So I think that is one thing that we have to continue looking at. But also the church can continue to evangelize the people, to introduce them to Jesus in many other ways that have really worked. And um, uh, considering on the different kind of communities and the kind of uh, youth or people that we do interact with. But, um, but also when you look at an opportunity here for us as a church, uh, when people stayed home and couldn't go to, to, to church, uh, I think it looked a little bit hard for some families to be able to join mass online and someone is still in bed. Uh, so it is an opportunity for us to build on to see how can families continue to pray together because we all know that uh, uh, we live in collective society and as Canadians, uh, we are known to be good at that uh, because the collective principles call us to work with others to achieve the common good, but also it's a communal thing and the right for us to be able to interact with others and also to reach out to them. Uh, but also as we move forward, um, we've seen um, in, I think in our previous discussion, we've seen uh, people cutting down on the activities that they have been doing individually, but also now they can do things uh, collectively. 
uh, for example, if you're going to use uh, the basketball game to evangelize, it's an opportunity for you to create a small team of a family. They play basketball and do something, and then Father Chris can say something to them and do some bit of evangelization. To me, I think uh, that has really helped us, and I, and I think we could find greater ways of being more open uh, to uh, new ideas and also to be able to reach out to uh, uh, to those that we are not uh, in position to reach out before COVID, uh, the online presence and stories and videos that people have shared. Uh, I've, on my phone, I receive all these short videos, whether it's Pope Francis doing something or someone great is talking, a bishop is uh, sharing some kind of uh, message. Uh, it is easy for us to be able to share that and communicate that in a short period of time, but very easily and in someone's comfort. Uh, so. Uh, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's what I can uh, think about. But also, this period has brought out very well the increased competitive spirit in us. How can we you know, build on that as Catholics to build even the way we evangelize uh, uh, to, 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 to do things that can make people be competitive in what they're doing and who can understand, who can read the scripture, who can interpret it in a faster way, and we set challenges. I've seen so many challenges online uh, during this COVID time. It might be hard to evangelize using TikTok, but who knows, some new innovations are going to come up and we can use those as opportunities for us. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, Martina and Father Chris, any, any thoughts on, on the opportunities of evangelization amongst COVID? When, um, when the church shut down in March, um, Bishop John from Yellowknife was doing the mass every Sunday. And there were also, on, and it's all online. And um, so a lot of people went on there to, to, um, to take part. And also, um, and when the church shut down, which is a large part of our lives, and uh, which is our life. And um, it was almost like thinking, outside of the box because you we have boxed ourselves into a certain way of thinking and of doing things and where we have to um, clear the cobwebs and to uh, and to see how it was supposed to be and and um, where um, we had to bring our barriers down to expose ourselves to to think of different and innovative ways of sharing. And a lot of it was a, um, I think again, like uh, reconnecting with my neighbor, things, things of that nature and of, um, of almost um, sharing what I was teaching or teaching in the church, outside of the church. Because yesterday in conversation, we were saying that the church is a building, the church, but you are the church. And so I had to look within myself and my faith and my hope and everything that I had been saying to make it real to other people who didn't understand uh, what all this, um, what this COVID-19 meant and where we had to social isolate and distance and isolate and, and, but still bring people together. So it was really um, reiterating to people that the church, the building may be closed, but you are the church to, to communicate that. No, no, thank you, Martina. Father Chris, final thoughts on, on the opportunities of evangelization amongst the challenges of COVID? Yeah, uh, the, the words that came to mind as everybody was talking was St. Augustine's infamous words of beauty ever ancient, ever new. And so, yes, we're called to, to be innovative in, in what we kind of take in and use as instruments to spread that gospel in all the ways that everybody mentioned. But at the same time, I think it's the opportunity to, to look back at the same time and re-examine how well connected we are to our roots. Uh, a term that's been thrown around in the Archdiocese of Edmonton recently is a radical rethink. And I think I like that word radical because it's, 
it's not usually when people think radical it's like all different and not normal but the word itself means having roots and so in that word itself it contains both having these deep-seated roots but at the same time being open to change and i think that's the the beauty of our catholic faith we have to be willing to move where the holy spirit is leading us and the circumstances of our life are the things that shape how the holy spirit is revealing the truth to us but that's always rooted back in the truth who is jesus christ who is immutable and doesn't change regardless of the way that the world changes around us and so i think that beautiful tension that we have in our christian faith of these two things together and relearning how to hold those those intention yeah no thank you thank you all and i'll ask you all to stay on the line but um Gerald Seguia, Dr. Peter Baltutis, Martina Norwegian, and Father Chris Schmidt, thank you so much. Uh, dare I say that also your reflections on your work in ministry is a source of evangelization for those who are able to watch this video when they have time. So today's session is, is a beginning, however, so the bishops have definitely invited those listening to contribute to thoughts and feedbacks on this, this video series. So we ask you to check out grandinmedia.ca um, to, to type in those reflections. The bishops would like to hear hear your thoughts on this pastoral letter and the reflections of, of the panelists. Um, so there'll be an email available at the bottom of the screen when it's ready. Um, and a reminder to join us for our next ref reflection that, that you'll also see advertised on Grand and Media. But I just ask that we end in a prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, you know, almighty and eternal God, our refuge in every danger, to whom we turn in our distress, in faith we pray, look with compassion on the afflicted, grant eternal rest to the dead, comfort to mourners, healing to the sick, peace to the dying, strength to healthcare workers, wisdom to our leaders, and courage to reach out to all in love, so that together we may give glory to your holy name, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.